Hello and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Zaki. Question I think everyone asks, you know, how can I repay this debt of gratitude? I think it's the same thing for how can I repay any debt? How can I repay anything is with your life and the way you live it, the way you interact with people, the way you impact other people's lives, the way you express yourself, the way you express your art is a way that you can repay that. But to think about it as a transaction is takes away the enormity of it because it's not, it's, it's just the way things are. The only thing I try to do is live my life the best I can. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. On this week's episode, we have actor Kelton Dumont. Please enjoy this episode. Kelton Dumont, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today. I know that uh, it sounds like you're in New York, and uh, I, I'm sure the, the city's exciting and uh, thriving. It's early in the morning here on the West Coast. How are you doing? Enough about me. <laughs> I'm doing great, you know. Um, I love being in the city, so it's just a great treat of being here. And um, yeah, it's just nice. nice to have be around all this, you know, hustle and bustle, and you know, yeah. seeing all seeing all my friends before going back up to school. So it's just great. Fantastic, I love it. So I'm curious. I ask everyone just to get get things kicked off, uh, and for listeners and viewers, kind of, can you tell us some of your background of maybe where you're born and raised, and then uh, ultimately, like, how did you get into acting um, as a career? Right. Um, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Nice. Um, I, I lived there from when I was born to about 10. And then okay. I did middle school and high school in New Orleans, Louisiana. Very different places, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, LA, I guess, is a bit more like New York in terms of just the speed of everything and everything moves so fast. In New Orleans, you know, it's the big easy. Everything's like a lot slower, you know. Things are done a lot slower, which which kind of works for me in a lot of ways. Um, I think especially as a young person, it kind of helped. In terms of getting into acting, uh, my dad's an actor. Mm-hmm. And um, he's been in the business for, you know, 35, 40 years since he mm-hmm. was my age. Yeah. And so um, he was able to help me get an agent and start auditioning when I was about 10. And wow. um, yeah, you know, just went from there. Amazing. What was the, I mean, obviously because you have like this, you know, lineage, your father, like you said, being an actor who I actually got to interview as well. Um, but, uh, you know, did you kind of find that path on your own or was it something that you kind of fell into because your dad was about it or kind of, you know, did you go to school specifically for it? I'm just curious about some more background. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely initially, it was definitely his introduction that really helped me. Mm -hmm. And especially being, you know, like, he's my dad, you know, you look up to him, you know, like what dad does is something that you want to do, you know, initially. And so that was definitely my introduction to acting. Um, But I especially found that it really helped me with my ADHD. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was struggling so much in school when I was like, you know, really young Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, to be able to take on a different character an audition or um, read as a different character just helped so much with my focus and concentration. And um, I didn't, I I did do acting in high school. I went to Mm -hmm. New Orleans center for creative arts and did that. And right now I'm enrolled in college. I'm not at an acting conservatory, but um, it's kind of a build your own education. It's called Bennington college. And um, yeah, I study acting there a little bit as well. So that's That's a big part of my life. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I'm curious, kind of, how did you go about, uh, you know, like you said, your your dad kind of, you know, helped you, if you will, or kind of got you situated uh, in the acting world at a very young age. Uh, I think you said, what, like 10 years old. So what was that like being uh, a child actor, if you will? You know, this, there's such like a, a quote unquote stereotype of what that means or kind of what's happened. But what was your experience like um, being on sets and kind of doing that work? Right. I mean, it it feels kind of weird because like, I don't know, I was a child at the time. So it's just kind of like, I felt more like a child than I could have really had perspective on what being a child actor meant. I was just like, I was just, someone would hand me something and I would do it and I had fun doing it, you know, experiences on set. You know, it's definitely funny on set being like the child, you know, because you're just like, okay, let's just make sure this person isn't crazy. Or usually, you know, with a child actor, you might have parents that are like, 
kind of out there, you know, usually this <laughs> is part of the stereotype. So um, it was funny to be around people like that and other, you know, child acting parents who are, you know, um, who are the way they are, you yeah. know, and uh, yeah, it was fun to be on set. And uh, yeah, I definitely did feel, you know, sectioned off from just like, okay, you know, well, he's the kid. And so, I mean, it's not like I was taking on super complicated roles when I was, 12 yeah. you know? <laughs> so yeah. yeah no absolutely that's cool i um think uh being on set in general right is kind of uh not only is it like a privilege but it like you said like as a kid you probably don't even know the difference from like you know what is this life versus if i weren't doing that because your dad was you know in, has been in the industry for so long what was it like for your mom like was she the one that would take you to set or be on set with you when you're doing these projects or kind of how does she feel uh having another actor in the family uh being uh you know in this field right um my mom's a lawyer she's an employment lawyer she's not an actor and she makes that very clear anytime people ask about it. <laughs> I think she thinks actors are crazy um, just because she doesn't understand how people could think like that, uh, even though she is a great reader. so. But nice. she, she refuses to like take that compliment. Definitely for um, when I started on The Righteous Gemstones, my mm -hmm. parents would alternate. Like, um, since I needed to have like a chaperone there while I was yeah. shooting since I was a minor when mm -hmm. I first started, there needed to be a parent to come down and like be with me. So usually my parents would alternate like that. And, you know, my mom was just my mom. It didn't really change. And yeah. my mom was wanted to support me in the ways that, in all the things that I wanted to do. So she was, she was all in for that. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, that's like the best of all the worlds, right? Is the fact that you have a supportive sure. family. And that wants, yeah, wants the best for you in such a difficult field as well, you know, as such as acting in, in Hollywood and whatnot. Um, so I'm curious, yeah. you know, what are some maybe personal struggles that you've had to go through uh, that you feel have almost helped you to kind of, you know, break through or be successful and to kind of continue going on as an actor? Having to juggle, I did, since I was at, um, during my high school time, I split for my junior and senior year, I split my time between an old boys Catholic school and the performing arts high school I went to, okay. as well as the television show. Right. And so I had to do all those things at once. And that was really, uh, intense. Mm -hmm. And also it was during, you know, like the back end of COVID. And so, right. you know, I might go to Charleston where we shoot and, you know, I'll shoot one day, but they'll quarantine me for nine. Oh, wow. And so I'll just be in a hotel room for nine days, missing nine days of classes with no way to make them up, except when I get back home, I'm just, you know, hit with this wave of makeup tests and quizzes for the time I don't have, you know? Right. And so that was really intense. And I had to, I had, uh, I really am appreciative of that time because I had to find a way to match it mm. because... I, I couldn't navigate myself or my life if I didn't have both my Buddhist practice and, you know, EMDR and tapping therapy and all mm. these other things that really helped me at that time. Yeah. And I just had to meet it with that intensity because the, it, because my environment was just as intense. So there was no other options. I had to, I had to find a way to, to make it work. And I did. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that was a big struggle for me. Wow. For sure. Yeah. No, I can only imagine, you know, um, I used to be in production and we would have, you know, either young actors or, you know, young talent models that are, you know, seemingly like kids. Um, and yeah, I don't know at what age kind of it stops or whatever, but usually, you know, there'd be like a, an onset teacher. Was that not something that you were yeah. able to do because you were enrolled in school or like, how did that kind of, um, how were you able to kind of <laughs> keep up with the work? Or you, like you said, you had to kind of make up time after the fact that seems like it's uh, not a waste of time, but yeah, it would be definitely more difficult than necessary. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, we did have an onset teacher, uh, Lori Klein. She was so cool. Shout out to Lori Klein. <laughs> she was awesome. Um, yeah. I've had a lot of onset teacher experiences that have been just like, not great where the person has been like, not able to help me at all or mm -hmm. understand like, what my education needs right now. And she was so understanding um, and just totally let me do my own thing. Um, the thing about 
um, making up things while I was shooting is that um, I wasn't able to make up any tests or quizzes while I was there. Mm. And um, that wasn't really a problem for my performing arts high school because we didn't have as much work. Yeah. But my Catholic school, we had like, you know, quizzes every day. And so mm. by the time I'd come back, I'd have like, you know, six quizzes, a few tests to make up on top of what I was already handling by the time I got back. Yeah. And so, um, and Zoom wasn't an option because everyone was in back in person at this time. Got it. Yeah. It, it was pretty much impossible to, to do it, but I, I, I actually, I did it. I, I don't know how I did it. I got notes from people that were in class. Um, I'm really surprised that I did it and also got a four O that last year, wow. which is kind of unreal to me, but um, yeah, no, definitely thanks to my practice. And, and the, yeah, like I said, like the intensity of what was happening to me, I had to find a way to, to match that. There was yeah. no, it was either that or just like be defeated and like do nothing. Hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, so you obviously just mentioned, uh, a couple times now that, you know, you have this Buddhist practice, uh, which is how, yeah. you know, I met your father as well, uh, through our Buddhist organization right. called the SGI. Um, so I'm curious, kind of like, how did you get, not only how did you get involved or kind of, um, what was the, the beginning point for you to start practicing? Because, you know, as a young actor, like you said, you know, being on sets and being a part of this, you know, quote unquote adult world at a young age, you know, um, for me personally, like I, you know, didn't really start practicing until much later in life, like on my own. So I'm just curious, like, what was it for you that, you know, really struck a chord and like kept you kind of uh, practicing to today? Right. Yeah. I mean, I was in the same boat as you. Uh, I'm a fortune baby, which means that my parent practiced. And so I, you know, took on that by being born, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I was so not interested in the practice. Mm. Uh, I was so weirded out by it. I was like, why is my dad mumbling these weird words? Why does he want me to go to these buildings with all these really happy people that are just so happy? And I just like, this is freaking weird. Um, and I think I felt that way for about, let's see, I started practicing right when COVID started, February, 2020. Okay. So I was, I was three, like three years ago. Yeah. I was like 16. Um, wow. I, I, the reason I started was I had my first love and mm -hmm. my girlfriend broke up with me and I was like, Oh my God, I was so devastated. It was so, you know, it was a really sad time. And um, yeah, you know, first loves are just so much. And so just, it was like a month after that. And I was just like, wouldn't get out of bed, all these other things, you know, I was just so, I was just so sad all the time. And I walked out of my room and I looked at the Gahunzen, which is like across from my room, hmm. outside of my room, the living room. And I was just like, why not? You know, like, I feel so terrible. Why not just try this? Yeah. It was weird. Like I looked at it differently from how I'd ever looked at it. I was like, hmm. you know, this feels pretty terrible. Like how, I couldn't get any worse right now. <laughs> And I chanted that day and I was like, I don't even think I chanted that day. I think I just sat there because I was like, I don't want to say these weird words. Like, this is weird. Yeah. But even just being in front of the Gahuns and I felt like a really intense reverence hmm. for my life and like permission, hmm. permission. I was like, and validation from, from myself. Like hmm. I was able to let go and also just like observe what was going on in my head. And then eventually, you know, as my dad kept encouraging me, you know, um, I stopped resisting what I was understanding so much, you mm -hmm. know, because I was like, I knew it was helping my life. And so it, it's still a struggle to keep up a daily practice every day mm -hmm. for sure. It's yeah. definitely a daily struggle. Yeah. Um, but it's a daily struggle that, you know, after every time I do it, I'm like, yeah, this is totally my thing. And, totally helps my life. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I need to do this more, you know, every time. And yeah, I, I can't get enough of chanting. I love it. It's that's great. Amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. so encouraging. Cause I think that, you know, a lot of young people, uh, you know, like yourself, right. Are, you know, struggle with all these things that you kind of mentioned, right. Yeah. With like ADHD. So yeah. And, uh, yeah. 
you know, the struggles of youth. And so, um, yes. yeah, it's funny. Cause you said like your dad was like chanting these weird words and you're kind of like, you know, what the hell? And sure. I feel like a, <laughs> a lot of young people probably feel that way. They're like, what are you saying? You know, sure. Namiho Renge Kyo is not something that just kind of floats off the tongue. So yeah, but I, I wanted to kind of uh, go back just a, a quick sec because I'm curious, like you said you were also enrolled in an all boys Catholic school. So that's such a, yeah. a different dichotomy from Buddhism oh, yeah. in general. So how did that kind of come about? I'm, and like, what was your experience like? Right. Um, so in New Orleans, um, uh, the, there's like really competitive public magnet schools that are really uh-huh. good. And, you know, like everyone's trying to get into them. Or there's the public school system, which is like a total mess and, and not great. Yeah. Or there's all boys or all girls. Or, or there's also super uber expensive private schools. Right. Or there's the a little bit less expensive all boys or all girls Catholic schools. Got it. And so um, by the time I got to New Orleans, I enrolled in an all boys middle school, which was like a total culture shock. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, but at, at that time when everyone was graduating, it was only 27 people in the graduating class. Wow. Uh, we all, they all were going to Jesuit, Jesuit mm. high school. And so yeah. I went to Jesuit <laughs> and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely a, a big culture shock and mm. that never really stopped, mm. honestly. Yeah. Um, but it definitely gave me, I think, especially with regard to my Buddhist practice, that lens, mm-hmm. you know, especially starting high school, not practicing Buddhism. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like hardcore atheist. I mean, I still am, you know, but <laughs> I was an atheist and um, super just like anti-religion, anti, mm-hmm. anti, I mean, I was just an angry kid. I was just super angry. Um wow. But when I started practicing, I started actually having a lot more um, openness to, like, the masses that we would go to every month and, Mm. you know, uh, curiosity about what was happening and also just, like, that similar sort of uh, resonance of when Mm. I'm chanting, of, like, when I'm sitting in mass, it's like, oh, this is a moment I can really, like, be calm and, you know, Mm. be a part of this with all these people. And so... Yeah. Um, that perspective totally shifted with my Buddhist practice for sure. Wow. I think that um, finding your own kind of personification of kind of, you know, the religion in general, you know, is something that each of us has to kind of find. Right. And I feel like so, so many people today are like anti, you know, like you said, they're atheist or like anti religion in general, like kind of, right, um, right. you know, boxed religion, if you will, for you, because you said you kind of, you know, are still consider yourself to be kind of an atheist. Like how does Buddhism kind of play into that for you? Uh, in the sense right. of like, you know, like you said, you have a daily practice and everything and it is, you know, technically, technically a religion. Uh, but you know, I feel like it's more encom- all encompassing than most religions. So I just want your take on it. Like, what do you, how do you kind of personify that for yourself? I feel like I misspoke a little bit. I'm not sure if I'm like, you know, fully atheist. I think that actually is something that is like shifted a little bit with okay. my Buddhist practice yeah. in terms of like seeing my Buddhist practice as both a conversation with myself and also a conversation with my higher self, which the lines between that and a higher power and the powers of the universe to me are, have been increasingly blurred, um, which doesn't change my relationship to my practice. It just expands it creatively. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so, um, cause it, it, to, to me, my practice really means a dialogue with all these selves, you know, as well as my like lower self and all these other things, you know, mm-hmm. um, and so I, I think I've categorized that a lot less hmm. now. Um, yeah, for sure. Nice. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I, to- I totally get it. Um, so I'm curious, you know, the, the idea of this podcast was born off of this Buddhist concept of the lotus flower, uh, you know, and the simultaneity yeah. of cause and effect. Um, but 
as I've said multiple times on this podcast, it's kind of like the, the shit or the muck underneath the water, right? Is the means for this beautiful flower to kind of bloom. So I like to ask every guest kind of what has been your, you know, shit or muck or struggle underneath the water that maybe is not seen that ultimately has led to like, you know, you becoming this, this great actor that is, you know, on a nationally broadcast, uh, televised show as the righteous gemstones. Um, and also just kind of, you know, creating a, a more magnificent life for yourself. Right. That's a great question. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, yeah, I definitely think uh, shame has been a really big one for me that I've struggled mm-hmm. with, particularly in the past few years. Okay. Um, just feeling like I don't deserve what's happening to me, that I don't, that I'm not appreciating things enough that, mm you know, eventually it's all just going to go away and it's all just going to fall apart. And, you know, no matter how good it gets, eventually it's going to, you know, uh, the shoe's going to drop mm. eventually, you know, and that has been a constant struggle for me, especially, you know, in recent years. And, um, yeah, just, you know, that has always brought me to the Gahunsen and brought me to my tapping practice. And, mm. you know, all, and all those practices like blend into one another, you know, chanting is like, th- those are like the ones I always gravitate to, but it's just all a circular effort, you know, mm. in the same way. And yeah, I think those are some of the biggest ones. I feel like I'm in a really good position with those, nice. um, which I, I'm really appreciative for. I'm appreciative to myself and, you know, those, the SGI organization and, uh, my parents, there's so many people that have been able to help and support me, friends and family, mm. um, lending advice and uh, lending their kindness and presence has been so important. Yeah. That's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Very yeah. well said. Next question is <laughs> what has kind of been your greatest achievement that maybe you're not necessarily known for outwardly, uh, but you kind of have this personal achievement that you're so proud of? I don't know. I think it would be either two things. I mean, Mm. especially such a young person, it's sort of like, I'm only growing into being an adult, you know, I'm about to be 20. And so feeling like saying I'm an adult still feels weird. (laughs) uh, Because I feel so young. And I am so young. Um, But I think it, it could be two things. One of them would be that fourth quarter of my senior year. Um, you know, everyone was, you know, not doing their work because they're like, I got into college, I'm already going, it's not going to change anything and all this other stuff. And I was like, mm-hmm. I haven't gotten a 4 my whole college career. I, when I started high school, I mean, college, high school, uh, when I started high school, I had like a 2-1 and like a 2-2. I was like, mm-hmm. d- my grades were terrible. I was like, I just want to get this 4 and I was doing... I was juggling the show, the two schools. I'd miss two classes every day with my two schools Hmm. that I just wouldn't be able to make up. I'd just have to get notes. So it was like an intense struggle. And I would wake up every morning at 630 and I would chant for 15 minutes and I would chant before I go to bed. And this Hmm. was every morning I did this, just keeping this goal in mind while working. And I came into the exam week with like a three, four GPA, um, and, you know, I was, like, chanting to do the best of my exams that I did. And then my grades just shot up after exams. Wow. Like, they never have before. And when my grades came in, I was like, I think I'm going to do it. And then I did the calculation. I was like, I actually did it. Wow. Like, I actually did it. I mean, it was just years of struggles with ADHD, struggles with anxiety, uh, especially my senior year. Friends, so many things, you know, culminated in this, like, really great personal achievement for me. And I'm someone who doesn't think grades matter so much, but it was just the fact that I think it was all the other things that went into it um, that made me feel so good. Um, I definitely say it's that or last year, me and my friends put on a production of Sam Shepard's Cowboy Mouth at our college. And it was just something that I've been dreaming of doing uh, when I toured Bennington College. And the fact that we were able to do it and how well it was received, but God, screw how well things are received. That's so overrated. Hmm. You know, even with like, Oh, I get a four Oh, like I know it was never like that for me because it was like, I knew it was something that I wanted to do. Hmm. And that was most important. And so 
I, I didn't really care much how it was received, but the fact that we did it and it went up and we put everything we had into it. Yeah. And I got to collaborate with two of my favorite people and two people that are just incredible actors and incredible people was just so meaningful to me. Yeah. It, it was just really, really beautiful. And we're going to do it again next spring and um, we're going to change it up. And uh, I'm just so glad that, you know, this project that was just an idea became, you know, with collaborators, with, uh, you know, efforts from teachers helping us out and all this other stuff actually came to fruition. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's amazing and beautiful. That just like you said, that's so cool. And yeah, I think that as an artist, not necessarily just seeking the achievement or like, you know, as a kid, like the gold star, right <laughs> on your hand or your forehead by the teacher, uh, is kind right. of like a, a great mentality to have because then you're really just doing it for the art's sake, right? You're really putting right. in the effort to, for not self gratification, but right. You, you, the achievement is like, wow, we, we made this thing happen, uh, which is right. what's about. So that's cool. Right. Um, right. So you currently in your, you're going into your sophomore year or, um, yes. okay. Nice. Sophomore year. Yeah. So what was that like for you? I mean, had you gone uh, and lived in New York at any time prior to that? Or, um, you know, coming, like you said, you've been in LA and then you went to New Orleans and then now you're in New York um, and, and at, such, at such a young age as well. Um, you know, kind of what has that been like for you um, kind of coming into, coming into your own and, you know, kind of like you said, sh shifting from like childhood into being an adult? Right. Um, I think New York's a great place for that. Um, I think it's a challenging place for mm -hmm. coming into your own, especially as a young person. But, you know, I'm one of hundreds of thousands of people that are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, Bennington's really cool because in between your first and second term, you get to do this thing called fieldwork term. Mm. And uh, that's six weeks where you get to go off campus and do an internship somewhere. And so I went to New York City and did an, a theater internship at Here Creative Arts in Soho. And that was really great. And I got to, I was living with my aunt mostly who was on the Upper East Side. Okay. And um, yeah, you know, I got a taste of, okay, you know, <laughs> I'm on my own schedule. I got to get up to work on time. I got to, I got to make sure I take the cue down. You know, I can't miss my stop or else I'll be late, you know? Yeah. And so, um I felt so happy, just so happy to have this independence, mm. um, you know, with its challenges. But, but, you know, like I said, like, I feel so armed, you know, in, in the softest way possible, you know, armed with my practice and all the other practices in my life that mm. make it possible for me to function, <laughs> mm. yeah. really function and also just uh, thrive, you know, when, um, when I really make use of it. And yeah. so, um, yeah, New York is definitely a place that brings out a lot for me. Mm. Uh, it brings out a lot for a lot of people. It's very raw and, you know, intense emotionally and, you know, this stimulation everywhere. And so, like I said, I had to kick up my practice and I had to, I had to, to match that. That was the only option or else yeah. I would have just been miserable. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's funny. I, it's similar age to you. I almost moved to New York, uh, cause I wanted to, I was like, I came to LA right out of college yeah. and then was like, okay, like LA was not what I thought it was. So I was like about to leave and then friends actually kept me <laughs> here in LA. And so yeah. I, I ended up staying. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that I've been to New York, a, you know, a few times since then. And I don't know the city. It's so much, like you said, like everything is kind of just like slapping in you in the face <laughs> everywhere you go. Like right. you jump on the subway, right. you're like, wow, it's, it's just a culture shock. But, um, yeah, I think that's so cool that at your age, you're able to really just kind of experience it and, um, yeah, kind of get all of the, um, or soak up all of the amazing culture that is, you know, in New York, which I'm sure also yeah. kind of influences the way that you act and the way that you are able to kind of perform. No. Oh, that's 100% the case. That's the reason why I'm here right now, yeah. this little stretch. And, um, yeah, I actually, I got to go see Otto Frank at the public over fieldwork term last mm -hmm. fall, last winter. Um, and I got to talk to Roger Guinevere Smith, who's an incredible actor in person. 
And I asked him, I was like, what's, what advice do you have for a young actor? And um, he said, you know, watch people on the subway. Mm-hmm. It was like, you know, Christopher, Christopher Walken would, mm-hmm. um, would go, would even in like the peak of his fame, would, would go in disguise to watch people on the subway. And he said he learned more there than any drama school could have ever taught him. Wow. You know, Roger Guinevere Smith is telling me this, you know, being, you know, a really highly educated person that, um, in the acting field. And just, uh, you know, I was like, okay, <laughs> I know my homework, you know. And um, that's definitely been really influential in terms of where people carry their weight. You know, especially in New York, people are always thinking, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the mm-hmm. next thing? You know, in the South, it's a bit more mellow and people are a bit more here. But in New York, everyone's, the next thing I have to do is always constant. Yeah. And then there are certain loops that people just can't escape from that are really prevalent mm-hmm. on people's yeah. faces, their expression, their posture. I mean, in New York, that's the great thing about it here is that people wear it so openly. Right. Yeah, and so it's a great place for observation. Do you personally f- kind of thrive off of that energy? Like, I know some people are, you know, they really like that's what they need in order to kind of be able to go. Or is it something that is more of a character study for you? Like you're saying, you know, and kind of like you keep it at that, but you're able to kind of stay in your own lane and do your own thing. Right. Um, you know, I definitely think that it would have been like impossible to. Uh, like participate in like actually thrive in this kind of environment if I didn't have the things that grounded me here. Hmm. And yeah, I mean, I definitely do think I thrive with that. Like I, especially as a Buddhist, you know, like when I chant and things are great, I'm like, Oh, I don't got a chant. This is great. You know? And then something happens. I'm like, Oh, I got a chant now. I got a chant, you know? So that's something I definitely struggle with Mm -hmm. is, you know, chanting when things are good Mm -hmm. as an appreciation or just to do it. Because yeah. anytime I do it, I'm always happy that I do it. And I always wish that I could do it more. And I think yeah. if I can. So, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think that's always the hard part is in the best of times, right? Staying the course and keeping it consistent no matter what is like the hardest thing for, for anyone. doesn't matter how many, right. you know, years or uh, lifetimes you've been practicing. You know, it's kind of like it's, it's still difficult because, uh, yeah, you want to like – you usually only go when there's problems, right? You know, to, to chant, but you know, to keep it consistent is, is the hardest thing. Um, so going into kind of more about you, what is kind of, what do you consider to be your greatest weakness? Uh, but when you recognize that weakness, what do you do to kind of shift it in the moment so that you kind of don't continue on that path? Wow. Such a big question. (laughs) That's a great question. I don't know. I feel like, especially with my practice, um, I was about to make a joke and be like, yeah, no weaknesses. Yeah, I have zero, <laughs> none of them. I really experienced that, actually. I think with my practice, my weaknesses and my like things that I'm really good at are mm-hmm. so close to each other. Mm-hmm. I think because of how sensitive I feel to everything around me mm-hmm. and my own pain and things that you know, I went through just as a person um, are so closely linked to what makes me who I am and what I love about myself and what I think other people love about me. Hmm. And um, yeah, I, 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 I definitely think that I think everything happens for a reason is such a broad thing to say. So hmm. I'd, that's not what I'm going to say, but, um, with my practice, I've been able to see the benefit of all the things that I've went through and the things that Mm. I continue to go through and that from those points, I'm able to actually jump and grow. Um, but I think growth can be also really misconstrued with, um, like a constant forward motion. Hmm. I think especially in New York, it's just like everything's forward. You're just like, next thing, next thing, next thing. You know, someone's screaming on the subway, you don't even hear it. They don't even exist. They don't, it doesn't even affect me, you know? Everything's oh. so desensitizing. Hmm. But um, I definitely think that uh, the biggest growth for me has been looking back and reflecting 
and processing so that when I move forward, it's not a distraction. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, very well said. Well, very well put as well. You're, as you mentioned, kind of at the top of this, you said that, you know, you're on the Righteous Gemstones, which, you know, for everyone that's watching and listening, if you haven't checked it out, please go and check it out. It is a freaking hysterical show. Um, but, you know, can you kind of share, like, you know, how did you get on the show? What has it been like working on it? What is kind of the, um, yeah, what does it mean to you to kind of be on such a big show that is doing really well uh, on a major network like HBO or Max? <laughs> and um, right. yeah, just kind of more on that story. You know, initially I got on the show, I just auditioned. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my dad read with me and I auditioned. And uh, he's actually also on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I auditioned and I had this little button at the end. A button is like just a little extra phrase you throw in at the end and my my character was just like some like asshole, just like some rude kid. And yeah. so my dad was like, you should say something like Ephesians, Ephesians 714 motherfucker or something like that. And so I, I said that and um, they really liked that, I guess. Mm. you know. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is happening now. And then I got called back and I went to Charleston and talked to them and you know, they mm. liked me. And so, um, it went from there, and then right when they were figuring out the travel schedule, they realized that, oh, Dumont, Dumont, are you guys related? And it's like, oh, yeah, we're father and son. And so they're like, oh, cool, we'll throw you guys in the hotel, and the same hotel. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Wow. <laughs> you know, um, which is which is unreal. It's unreal um, yeah. that, that, hap- that that is happening, that that happened. And when I get to share you know, a television show with my dad, Right. How, how awesome is that? Like they can't, they can't be beat. Um, what were some of your other questions about the show? <laughs> no, I was what, just kinda... what it's like to be on a, an HBO yeah. show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's great. You know, I mean, I'm just so appreciative of getting this kind of experience at such a young age, mm-hmm. you know, and at such a developmental period. I mean, I started right. the show when I was, the pilot was when I was 14. Wow. And, you know, 14 to 19 is like <laughs> the biggest years ever, yeah. you know, like they're, they're so intense and they were, you know, and so to have this obligation that you, you go and do, I mean, not just an obligation, but, you know, an obligation when you're 14 versus mm-hmm. when you're, you know, revisiting it throughout the years, there's always a different perspective on it and also yeah. just growth. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, what is it like being on a successful HBO show? It's such a weird question. Not a weird question. It's, I think it's a totally normal question, but it feels weird to me just because I'm a college student and I'm just a student, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, I'm just a student and a person. And um, I think connecting with the humanity of what I try to do with my work is everything. Mm. And I think I've realized that recently, especially with working on the show, that that is everything. Mm. And that, you know, I felt so, in- I still feel intimidated, but I felt enormously intimidated when I first started because I'm a young kid actor mm. with sharing the space with, you know, um, John Goodman, Danny McBride, you know, these masters of of their work, of their craft, you know, Ian yeah. Patterson, Cassidy yeah. Freeman, Tim Baltz, these people that um, master improvisers and, you know, classically trained people. Yeah. And I'm not any of that. <laughs> mm. I'm not any of those things. And so, uh, you know, so much of me wanted to get validation from that. and was mm. like, I want to make them laugh. I want to show them, look at me, look at me, look how look good I am. Look how good I am. I can, I can keep up. I can keep up. You know, but once I started looking back and dealing with that part of myself that was so attention hungry, that is so attention hungry, it's a constant thing, Mm -hmm. then then I can actually start making work that's my own and that's not so based around wanting attention Mm -hmm. and wanting validation because I can't make good work if I'm constantly in that loop. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. It's been the biggest thing for me. Yeah. yeah. What, at what point, cause you know, it's, uh, you know, been a few seasons now. So kind of at what point were you kind of recognizing that, right. Where you were able to kind of switch it. So it wasn't necessarily this, 
I need to appease or appeal or, you know, show how, <laughs> how amazing I was, but really yeah. kind of just honing in on the work, obviously enjoying it, you know, I would hope, but like, um, just, you know, kind of recognizing that like the reason you're on this show, there's a reason for it because you're kind of right. at the caliber at which so are these people, right? They see that in you. So did, right. was there a moment where you're like, damn, I get it now. This is why I'm here. Right. Yeah, definitely. It, it was just, you know, I think one of the things I've realized is that I, I mean, people can see whatever in me, but it's my own system, belief systems that are going to be everything. And right. so if I don't see that in myself, it's totally worthless. Mm. And so, you know, being on the show, people are like, you're so funny. You're so this, you're so this. It's like, you know, that, you know, that feedback is not going to resonate or do anything mm -hmm. um, if I don't believe it myself. Mm. It's not going to, it's just going to be like, feel weird, yeah. you know? Um, and so working from that inward point of, I, I am here for a purpose. Mm -hmm. I got cast because for, for a purpose and I can do this and I can do this the best way that I can. Yeah. Um, and I will, um, has definitely been the priority. I think after season two, mm -hmm. this season, this third season was when I really started. I mean, you know, I'm coming into my own as a person, you know, I'm, a, I'm an adult, you know, I, I started traveling by myself to, to set to, to Charleston, which is, yeah, crazy you know i mean i'm in college i'm in a dorm with like 500 other teenagers right. but when i'm in charleston i'm in a hotel room with myself and a city full of all kinds of people you know right. so right. it's um that brought up so much for me and um yeah i definitely feel like i was able to just like have a lot more fun as the character this this uh this season yeah. It just, it, it felt so much like me, you know, and also not, you know, <laughs> also yeah. not in a lot of ways, you know, I'm not yeah. sure I, you Pontius is someone you really want to look up to as a person. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. Um, you definitely want to stay away from him, but, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, it, it felt, it felt like a part of me that I got to let out. And so that's, that's the fun of acting, you know, that's, what's fun. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a, f a fan of the show myself. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's such a great show. Um, and you know, the themes that are kind of in the show are so kind of like, you know, in Buddhism, we talk about the 10 worlds, right? Which is like, you go from yeah. like hell to like Buddhahood, right? At the highest and the lowest yeah. and like, you know, everything in between. So, you know, there's so many themes that are in this show that are just like, to be quite honest, like just like fucked up, <laughs> you know, like this family oh, and yeah. the dynamics and everything. Um, oh, what, how is it, what was that like? I mean, like you said, you were kind of in these, uh, like your, your, not the wonder years, but it's kind of like the years of your life where you're going through your teenage dumb, if you will, that, you know, how influential was that? I also don't know how much you were around the other, you know, actors or scenes and kind of working with them outside of, you know, the, the scope of your own work. But yeah, I'm just curious, kind of like watching the show back now, are you kind of like, whoa, what was I, what, what was I a part of for the first two seasons? And now that you're, you know, an adult, it's kind of like makes a little more sense or yeah, I'm just curious. I think that, um, you know, I felt a bit frustrated when we first started out just because, I mean, you know, it's a very normal thing as a kid. You want to grow up as fast as possible. And once mm -hmm. you get there, you're like, take me back, take me back. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, you, I don't want to do any of this responsibility stuff. Yeah. And, um, you know, I wanted to just run, you know, full speed. I was like, give me like a hard character. Like, I don't just want to be a kid. I want to be, mm. you know, I want to have a story, you know, and, and that's definitely where more of the fun has come in for me in season two and three, particularly three with like all these cool tattoos and stuff, you know, where it's like, um, I feel like I get, you know, I get to be a more complex character yeah. and that's great. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's funny. Um, I actually, I think I text your dad this because we were Mm -hmm. talking about setting up this interview, uh, with you. And, um, I was like dying laughing because your, your character is like a teenager, but then you have like this sex scene this season and not to give any spoilers, but like, what is that like (laughs) now that you are an adult? I mean, you started, like you said, when you're 14 and now, you know, you're like an adult, you know, um, you know, being on. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. So kind of, yeah, it, it share as much or as little as you want, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, no, that's uh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think one of the funniest things, actually, um, is that, you know, a lot of the set people on set I've, have been there since the pilot, you know? Right. And so they right. knew me when I was 14. Now they're like, he's doing a sex <laughs> Is this really? Yeah, I knew him as this, like you know, he was like five two when we first yeah. started. Yeah, I was you know five two and like seventy pounds. I was about to start high school. Yeah, you know? and I like <laughs> have this like girlfriend on the show, and I'm doing a sex scene, and I'm going to college, you know, and all this other stuff. And um, yeah, it. Yeah, sorry. What was the question? I just got distracted. Um, <laughs> You're good. No, it was yeah. just like kind of what was that like for you as an actor? I mean, it's kind of like, like you said, you kind of grew up on the show, right? But then also right. now you are doing the sex scene that, you know, you're, you're showing your adult kind of grown teen self on the show. And what was that like for you? I mean, there's no hiding, you know, it was all there. Uh, I was, I, was, it was so fun. I was just so happy. Um, the person I worked with was, was so cool. She was mm. awesome. Nice. And so kind and so uh, hilarious, like mm. absolutely hilarious. Um, and it was just really funny. It yeah. was really fun. It was, you know, I'm so scary doing a sex scene, you know, it's mm. like, wow, that's like so scary, you know, but um, I'm just so fortunate with the people I was working with um, and everyone made it so cool and, you know, as seamless as possible and it went so well and it was just, mm. And, and, and it turned out great on screen, you know, and that's like such a satisfying feeling because, you know, uh, th- uh, there's still that uh, attention seeking part of myself that always exists. That's, you know, like, oh, well, did, did they see this moment that I did? Did they see that moment? Oh, that moment was really cool. They should have got that moment, you know, but mm-hmm. when they do, when you feel like they do, you're like, oh, you know, this I- I'm being seen, you know, mm-hmm. um, and so. <laughs> I really was being seen in that scene. You know, you saw all of me. Um, yeah, I, I could say something really, some bullshit about how it felt so metaphorical that, you know, I'm being seen, I'm growing up, and this is my whole body, you know, but it really just felt funny and lighthearted and goofy, like, you yeah. know, everything about the show is. Yeah, yeah. And definitely Absolutely. very weird. Yeah. fun and awesome and i do it again and it was great nice <laughs> yeah but that's the best definition of uh a sex scene for tv i think i've ever <laughs> i've ever heard that's, <laughs> that's amazing yeah which is funny because i mean it, it that whole thing kind of goes into the fact that like male nudity in general is kind of always seen as this silly thing you know it's never like i mean yes there's like men get sexualized i think more now than they probably were for gears, but it is funny right. because, well, and especially because you're young, right? It is almost like not taboo, but it is like, holy shit. Like, you know, we're, it's like a coming of age story, you know, in a very comedic kind of way as well, which, you know, for I sure. think Danny and the writers and everyone who kind of put that whole thing together is kind of like, no, that's real. Like, you know, walking in on your son, like having sex with his girlfriend or something yeah. is kind of like, oh shit, this is real life. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm curious, have, Besides the show, um, or including the show, kind of has there been a moment where you feel like you quote unquote made it, or that you've kind of had this highlight of your career uh, thus far? I know that you're, you know, like you said, you're just coming into your own as an adult and you know just right. getting started. So, um, yeah, just kind of curious. Um, do I feel like I've made it? I don't feel like I've made it at all. I don't ever want to think about myself as ever having made it in mm. any capacity. And <laughs> in, 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 I think I think in that not in any capacity, but you know, in that way that I think a lot of people think about it, including yeah. myself. Um, and it's definitely hard to to navigate of just like you know to have all these incredible opportunities as a young actor, and then to be like, 
yeah, I'm just such a humble guy, you know, like, look at me, like, even though I have all this, like, I'm so humble, you know, mm. like, yeah. but that's really, I just want to be a, a regular person and I'm a kid and I'm acting is just something I do. Mm. Um, you know, it's a way of expressing part of who I am, but it's not exclusively who I am. And particularly it's not who I am in how I'm received when I work. Yeah. You know, it, it's a space for me to have fun and work on uh, an art and a craft that is fun for me and that continues to be fun for me and is, and, and develops with continuously how I develop as a person. But I'm, I mean, I got class in a few weeks, you know, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I got class, it real. you know? And so I just like my priority right now is just enjoying college and making the best of my education. Yeah. Um, that's where I'm at. You know, we're continuing to work on my craft, work on the show, um, and just enjoying, you know, yeah, I love the that phrase, you know, suffer what there's to suffer, enjoy what there's to joy, and never stop chanting. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's where I'm at. You know, I'm, I'm hoping to do all those things because I can't have one without the other. Right, right, yeah. Can't have one no. without the other. Yeah, that's very well said. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what brings you the most joy or happiness now versus maybe when you first started acting, uh, kind of in the professional acting space? Yeah. Um, I think when I first started, it was largely just like, my dad's so happy that I'm doing this. This is so cool. Mm. He's so happy, you know? Um, like, oh my God, he said I did good. That's so good. That means everything, you know? Um, and obviously it means a lot, you know, your dad saying that you're, you're doing well, at something that's the best, you know, yeah. that's awesome. But right now, especially growing up as an adult, um, I just love working with people, especially at Bennington. Like there's so many incredible artists and actors. I'm taking a Shakespeare class next term and there's, I got some friends in it and I'm just, you know, I'm just so excited to, to be a part of that space with everyone. Yeah. And, um, yeah, because it's like I look up to everyone that I that I'm working with. It's like everyone's just so amazing and awesome. And like to put yourself out there in that vulnerable way that that would act. That's what acting is: being vulnerable and open. Yeah. Um, is so hard, and I have so much respect for that. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what is kind of your work ethic like? Like you said, you're going to school, you want to like focus on that, which is totally makes sense and you should. Uh, but you know, being that you kind of were acting and in school at the same time throughout your high school years and now in college as well, kind of like, what is your, you know, kind of like day in the life like, or how do you kind of manage both when you have to like learn scripts, but also, you know, study your academics and all those things? Um, well, I wake up every day at 4 a.m. and I do an hour of vocal warm ups. <laughs> Oh, Dad, I really, I'm so fucking gullible. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I wake up at 4 a.m. every day. I do my, I do an hour of my vocal warm up, and then I, I run five miles, um, with no shoes. Yes. Um, but um, no, uh, my work ethic is just kind of normal. I guess uh, I wouldn't say it's super great, honestly. <laughs> Uh, when, when I say when I say I'm uh, working with a script, it's it's uh, I'm much more serious about it, uh -huh. you know. But uh, I also hate that word. It's just like, you know, with acting, you just you really have to balance seriousness with as soon as you're expected to do the work, you have to throw all of that away hmm. and have as much fun as possible and respect the time you put in behind it. But if you didn't put in time behind it, then there's nothing really to, to be said for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause then you're just working off of instinct, which is fun, but you know, um, yeah. Cause when I'm, you know, like I'm going to be auditioning, you know, in a few weeks for the plays at school. And so, you know, uh, yeah, you know, just navigating sincerity behind my work while being able to have fun in the room. That's everything, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, as juggling all this as a college student, um, you know, we'll see how it goes with the next season, with when that when that falls mm -hmm. and all that stuff, which we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we know that we are greenlit for another season, which is incredible. Yeah. Uh, 
so awesome, so awesome, super excited. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just right, right now what I'm juggling is just, um, with, with school is just work, Mm -hmm. play, friends, having fun, um, just regular things, Ah. you know? And then when, when the the spring sun comes for the next season, you know, go from there. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. You have to live your life. You know, like you said, like enjoy what there is to enjoy, suffer what there is to suffer, but you know, keep chanting no matter what. It is that, you know, and especially at this time in your life, I think you have to like extremely, you know, kind of not take it to the extreme, but like, yeah, just live as you, as you should, you know, and enjoy all those things. Cause like you said, you can't yeah. go back, you know, like you said, being a kid, you're like, I want to go back to that, but you can't. So, right. you know, just enjoy the moments that you, you have now with your friends and college and all of that. Yeah. So. And, yeah. and I want to be very clear that um, it's that I think with all the societal pressures right now of social media and mm-hmm. everything that we have to go through as young people, um, I know that it is pretty much impossible for me to enjoy things in my life if I don't chant, if I don't take mm-hmm. care of if I don't do certain things in my day, my whole day is done. Hmm. I just can't, I just can't. Um, and I want to make that very clear that in order for me to enjoy, in order for me to like, you know, if I'm going out to dinner with my dad or my family, mm-hmm. that in order for me to actual, actually feel enjoyment, I have to do things uh, beforehand or after or all the other things in between in order to actually be present in the experience because that's what hmm. enjoyment is. To me. Right. Right. And and it's so hard to do right now, especially as a young person with all that's expected of us. Yeah. And um yeah. So enjoying isn't just like, oh yeah, this is great, you know. It's yeah. I really gotta do I have to do so many things to enjoy basic things. <laughs> mm. You know. Yeah. So you brought up social media. I'm curious kind of how, if at all, has that been kind of an influence on your life as a young person? You know, kinda oh, yeah. you know you you're in your you know your teen years while social media was kind of you know growing and becoming more and more of a thing and now it's like so influential in you know every sphere of life um yeah what is your kind of take on that how involved are you with it do you care (laughs) right um that's a really good question i think that's one i've been considering a lot recently especially as the show has been kicking up so much more ground Mm -hmm. you know and you know there are people that are very all or nothing about it that are very very um, you know, and I think it's funny that there's, you know, somewhat of an axis of that on the show, I guess, with different actors who are, you know, really involved with social media and some people who are kind of involved with it and some people that are just like, will never go on social media ever. Right. Um, you know, I think, I think it's really normal for a part of myself to be like, I'm, you know, um, I, I like to describe it as like either like a drill sergeant or like a monk. Like as a part of myself that's like, I will never ever do this and I, I'm going to abstain from this and I'm going to live uh, some sort of like life. But that's just escapism, honestly, uh, mm. to me. That, that that part of me is very much based on escapism. Um, and so, yeah, that question has been really big for me right now. Like I said, with the show coming up, you know, I, I like to use social media as just uh, both a means to express um, things I care about, things I enjoy. Um, you know, little snippets of, uh, God, it's just so weird to talk about little snippets of me. That's so weird. I hate that. (laughs) Um, but you know, just, yeah, try to make it genuine to me and, you know, share experiences that I enjoy because there is a, I do a thing that I've recognized is just like, when I see that someone's having a good time. Mm-hmm. I want to have a good time, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I feel encouraged sometimes, and sometimes I'm like, "Oh gosh, they're having such a good time! Like, good for them," you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think right now I've been using social media as just a means to express good times with my friends, my family, things mm-hmm. that I'm interested in that happen in the world. Um, you know, a way to use my voice that isn't overshadowed by how I use it in my everyday life, which is unquestionably more important in every way. Um, 
that I've, that I've, that I've been realizing that, um, you know, I can focus so much on how I'm the person that is being perceived through Instagram is being seen, mm-hmm. but that doesn't matter at all. And so mm-hmm. the more I can make it kind of not super big and important, the better, I think. Yeah. Um, keeping it lighthearted, I think is good for me. And also my account, you know, is private. And I think I prefer it that way right now mm-hmm. with where I am. You know, I might make a public account in the future and make that more of like a, like, <laughs> an even more increasingly fake, like, I'm an actor, Kelton Dumont. God, I mm. hate that. You know, um, <laughs> I hate that. But, yeah. Yeah. Just like keeping it, I, I don't usually let people follow me that I don't know. Mm. Um, or that I'm not, you know, mutual friends with or something like that. I mean, mm. yeah, it's weird to talk about. <laughs> as like a whole separate universe, but it is. Yeah. Um, I think the the influence of it in my younger life was so intense. Um, it, it, cause social media gamifies interaction. Interactions become a game right. and they become an exchange, a transaction. And, um, when you're constantly trained on that, it bleeds into your life or comes into your life in ways that, that are purely reflective of where you are at the time, you know, mm-hmm. cause you can use social media to really spread a message and like make an impact on people. Cause people watch and people see and people process things that are happening. Right. You could also use it to numb. I do that a lot. I'll just doom scroll and I'll just mm-hmm. be like, I don't want to do this in my life. And I'm, you know, I, that's why I'm scrolling. Cause I don't want to do this. And, and, and then what, what's happening, what I'm perceiving is not even processed cause it's just, muck at that point right um but i definitely think as a young person it's it's purely reflective of my headspace you know person and environment are one and you know where i was at as a young person wasn't super great and i wasn't really happy and um so i wasn't using social media in a way that made me happy or you know felt very hollow and you know my my life felt hollow so it makes sense Yeah. yeah Yeah. So that's interesting that you say everything that you shared and thank you for sharing that. I, I'm curious to kind of expand upon that because you're on a recognizable show, right? And I'm sure, I mean, as weird as it may sound, like you probably do have fans of you as an actor, right? So how do you kind of, you know, balance that, if you will, <laughs> if you can, um, in the sense of as you keep going forward, right? And you start doing more notable acting work, does it, do you feel like you have to put on, not even put on airs, but like, you know, present yourself in a certain way on social media or outwardly to the world, um, you know, because of the, the work that you do? God, that's such a good question. That's a really good question. You know, I think the answer that I don't like is yes, that that is the case. And I do feel like I have to change um, certain things about myself and the way I'm presented and, you know, if I'm going to like a premiere of something that I need, you know, I'm acting a certain way and this other thing, but, um, above all else, I just really want my genuine kindness to come through as much as possible. And th- and that's just how I feel in my heart. And that's what I always want my work to be around. And that's what I always want my interactions to be based around is how much I care about other people. Uh, yeah. Interacting on social media, um, yeah, that's definitely something that like I don't really ha- haven't really set like a preference or like a set of rules for myself for how I interact with fans. You know, I think talking to fans is great, but um, I like spending time doing other things. Yeah, you know, things that I'm interested in. Yeah. You know, and I and I know some people have it differently. Are always you know posting up with their fans saying this sort of stuff, but. Um, I mean, not, not that that's a problem for me at all, because no one's posting up like, look at how awesome Pontius is. Like, no one has ever done that. <laughs> and not that I want them. To. It's just, um, yeah, that's definitely not a problem for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nice. I'm not bombarded well, I'm sh- with Instagram DMs from people. Definitely. You are? You said? <laughs> I'm definitely not. Oh, definitely not. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. No. Well, that's- no. No yeah. problems. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, that's a good thing yeah. then. I mean, yeah, you haven't yes. dealt with that yet. Yeah. 
So what's one thing that you've learned about yourself getting into this acting world and, you know, becoming a television actor and a theatrical actor and really, you know, kind of making your career uh, based in the arts? Yeah, just art is um, everything to my life. Hmm. It should be everything to everyone else's life as well. I think that's a really important thing to say as well as... You know, I think especially with social media is you're bombarded with people that you're constantly seeing being successful in all these other ways. And it makes you feel like I need to do more. I need to do more. I need to do more. I need to feed this machine. Right. Um, but that's, that's not right. And so sometimes I can get my art confused as, you know, if I'm not making art, if I'm not working on my art, I'm nothing. I'm worthless. Mm. I think that's totally not true. And so although I think art is the most important expression, it, it's expressing yourself in a world that, you know, my body in this life is in this body in this life is impermanent. You know, this body's gonna be gone, I'm gonna be gone. Mm. But art in my impact can last forever. Mm. And forever, you know, last forever, you know. But you can let a part of yourself out into the world that is in a way that's so invaluable. And, um, yeah. 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 I think I definitely learned that, um, yeah, that art and self care go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Um, but art purely based on, you know, like a catharsis or like, your wounds is mm -hmm. not um, the art that I want to focus on. Mm. You know, I want to be able to have that experience while also having the technique to make sure that to the best of my ability, that what I'm doing is being that I'm able to affect people Yeah, with my work. Yeah. And that's it. That's really, that's all I care about is being able to affect people while navigating my intense desire to want to affect people with, I need to take care of myself and be soft with myself and kind to of myself hmm. and navigating those worlds, which can sometimes be contradictory oh. um, is I feel like one of the important keys for me. Yeah. Tools. I prefer, yeah. Tools sounds better to me. Tools. Yeah. yeah. Very well said. Love it. Um, I'm curious you know, who has kind of been your biggest supporter or fan uh, that you've kind of, you know, been able to seek from, but also has really kind of helped you to kind of keep going when like you're down or you feel like you don't want to do this or you're frustrated, uh, but they've been there to kind of like ensure that you're, um, yeah, keep going forward, like you said. Right. Um, well, it changes so much, you know, mm -hmm. but w one person that's so consistent in my life is, you know, my parents, my mom and my dad are just, they're two opposite people. Mm. You know? I mean, not, not to mention that one, like I said, one's an employment lawyer and one's an actor, yeah. but they both have very different perspectives. And I know that when I'm going through something, I can call my dad and get his perspective. And I can call my mom and she'll, she might say the opposite, but mm. regardless of what they say, they're both going to support me no matter what. And that I can't even express how, appreciative I am and lo how much I love them. It's, it's something that it's like a debt that I'm never going to be able to repay hmm. yeah. as much as I'd like to try. And I will try. Um, there, my relationship with them is never, um, it's everything to me and my brother as well. It's hmm. family is so important to me. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So. Yeah. In Buddhism, you know, the concept of filial piety is kind of a, a very big concept <laughs> to kind of wrap around, right? But this kind of debt you owe, right? Your parents. But I always think it's interesting too, because, you know, the, in Buddhism, we talk about like you chose this life and you chose your parents, you know, to be born in this lifetime. So the fact that, you know, we have this opportunity as great or as, you know, however your relationship is with them, you know, it's ultimately like our decision. So like what you do with that is up to us. But yeah, I always feel like for me personally, you know, it's kind of like, I always feel like I owe this great debt of 
gratitude, you know, like you said, you're a fortune baby and so am I, you know, born into this practice, but like how beautiful that is, but ultimately it's up to us, right? What, what we do with that and how we repay that debt, um, and of appreciation and gratitude and, you know, compassion for our family. So yeah, I can completely, um, relate and understand. Yeah. And then also, you know, like you said, um, yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's such a big question. I think everyone asks, you know, um, how can I repay this debt of gratitude? Mm-hmm. And it's really, um, I think it's the same thing for how can I repay any debt? How can I repay anything um, is with your life mm-hmm. and the way you live it, the way you interact with people, the way uh, you impact other people's lives, the way you express yourself, the way you express your art is a way that you can repay that. But to think about it as a transaction is takes away the enormity of it because it's mm-hmm. not, you know, it's, it's just the way things are. Yeah. I'm never going to be able to repay that debt. And so um, I, I just, the only thing I try to do is um, live my life the best I can and support them and be there for them and, support myself because they're not going to be here forever. And that's the way that I can live through them. Hmm. Yeah. That's the way I can live through anyone. Yeah. Profoundly said once again. So I only have a few more questions here, but uh, I was curious kind of, you know, you mentioned a little bit about it, but you know, obviously we just came out of three years of COVID it's still around, but kind of like you were, I think you said you're going through high school while this was all going on, kind of like mm-hmm. what, you know, like, how did you keep going uh, during COVID, you know, when the world shut down for quite some time, and then slowly but surely, you know, we kind of came back. But what was that experience like for you, especially being on a show and also being in school and, you know, coming of age? Yeah, it's so interesting getting everyone's perspective on COVID. Um, and it's not like my broader perspective has changed. I mean, it's an incredible tragedy and, a, you know, pandemic was so detrimental and terrible for so many people. Um, but to get people's personal interactions with this event that we all sort of had no um, response other than to like rotate around, like this is just a big, you know, it's like a gravitation, like we're all in this like pull around right. COVID. Like it's a, It dominates all of our lives. I think COVID made me, yeah, I was a real, I was a real asshole in high school. You mm. know, I just... I, I just tried to be someone else that I wasn't. And, you know, I ended up hurting people that I really cared about. Mm. And during COVID, I had to, you know, uh, face, start facing that. Mm. And I think being home so much, being inside so much, forces you to not distract you know Mm. or you can distract but it's harder yeah and so um a lot a lot came up and um i had to deal with it and i had to change a lot of things Mm. yeah Yeah. i think especially just uh, that's my experience especially as a young person who is still finding themselves as opposed to someone who may be in their 30s you know not not to yeah but, uh, yeah, 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 no, I get it. Yeah. I mean, as fun. someone, as someone in their thirties, I totally, it's just right. completely different experience right. than what, what I'm sure you were going through. Absolutely. You know, but, um, in that time of kind of isolation or, you know, I guess, was it, was it really reflective for you? I guess is the, another question I could ask, uh, in that time, right. especially since you had so much time on your hands. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I, was like, I went out with my friends so much during COVID. Like that was Mm. the peak of when I would like go out, which was like so terrible and like so unsafe. Mm. But I, I I don't know if I can say that I needed to do that, but I know with where I am that that's how it needed to happen for me right? in order to see that what I was doing, the way I was treating myself was purely uh, a cause of was purely reflective of how I was treating other people. 
Hmm. And so I have to treat other people better. And I have to treat myself better. And, you know, more is going to be expected of me, especially as a young actor on this show in the right. public eye. Mm -hmm. And more is going to be expected of me as a student and a person as I'm being a fucking adult. You know, yeah. so I got to, I got to, you know, I got to deal with all this stuff. I got to process this or else I'm just going to be, this is who, this is going to be who I am. And yeah. I didn't really, I didn't really want that to be who I, I always wanted. God, this is so deep. <laughs> Uh, I didn't, I just, I just had to change. I just had to change and chanting. Th there was no change that could have happened without a practice that made me feel grounded and present, ah. you know, cause if I'm in my head, I can't change. I'm defensive and I'm vulnerable and I want to react. So I have to ground myself and I have to take care of myself if I want to change. Yeah. That's everything for me. Yeah. Drop the mic yeah. moment. Well said. Very well said. Drop. <laughs> I only have a few more questions here, but uh, looking to the future, you know, like you said, you're in your sophomore year, uh, but what are some of your goals you may have for the next like three to five or even 10 years from now uh, that you want to achieve, you know, as an actor and life just right. in general? <laughs> right. Right. Um, I mean, you know, three years, I want to definitely graduate, you know, and through that time, I really want to explore myself through different artistic mediums you know next mm. term i'm taking a lot of uh i'm only taking one acting based class and so i really want to explore these different mediums uh you know writing uh multimedia work sculpture dance and um follow my curiosity i think the mm -hmm. biggest thing since getting to college and being a young person was following my curiosity because that's everything and especially in my art what i'm curious about is what other people are also curious about and so seeing inherent value in that and the only momentum that i can have in order to finish something or create something that is meaningful is through having a practice where I feel like I can light that flame of inspiration in myself. Because, mm. you know, sometimes I can get so bogged down by certain ideas and my own, my own curiosity can be so overwhelming because it's just like, there's so much, so many things I'm interested in. But um, I think continuing to forge my life, you know, in that way through my practice and through, through everything I do, um, in the next three or five years is so important to me. You know, I'd love to be, um, after I graduate, I'd love to go right into try to get work. You know, um, right now I'm pretty much only, I don't, I don't really audition much. Um, mm. right now because it's like school and the show. And if I, you know, book something, I don't want to, I don't want to leave school. I really want to, I really want to go to school. I don't want to graduate. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, after graduate, I want to, um, you know, be kinder to myself and also just be able to, you know, live life in the closest way that I, I, I've always wanted to live it, the ways that I've dreamed about, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, working in theater, working in film, working in television, oh. um, and trying to do that and learning my craft, you know, all that stuff, learning yeah. about myself all one in the same. Nice. Uh, I'm curious just cause you are, you know, much younger than myself. I'm just curious. Do you feel like there's uh, any desire or need to kind of like live the American dream in the sense of like owning a house or, you know, being like having the, the wife and the kids or, you know, and the, the white picket fence. Is that something uh -huh. that you, <laughs> do you feel like that's something that you, aspire to or is that kind of like I, generationally i think everything has really changed so i'm just curious like what your take on that is yeah wow no one has ever asked me that ever that is so <laughs> funny wow no one has ever asked me about if i wanted about a nuclear family in my life that is so funny um but yeah that's a great question though um yeah i definitely uh i definitely see myself 
as someone who wants to get married in the future, I want to have kids really bad, you know, um, I really want to have kids. I also want to be young and be able to explore for years, years and years to come, you know, but, um, I want to find the right person and, um, yeah, I want to be, a, I want to be a dad, you know, that sounds awesome. Um, nice. I just love to be a dad. Um, but I've got to be me first <laughs> and I got to be a really good version of me so that when my kids come into the world, if they come into the world, that, um, I can be able to support them in the ways that in the best way that I can. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Housing. Uh, hmm. yeah. I mean, I'd love to own a house. That'd be great. You know, um, Wow, well, I've never thought about that once. <laughs> I've never thought about, you it's know, so good. do I want to own a house? Wow, I mean, like, I'm living in a, you know, a 200 square foot dorm with another person, you know, 10 feet mm. from me. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that'd be great. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I didn't realize you were actually in a dorm right now. I was like, I was wondering where you were at. Oh, not right now. Obviously, not right now. Oh, not right now. Okay. I was like, you are in college. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's where I'm yes. at. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just got, you got it. I was like, that's a nice ass background for a dorm. If you are at a dorm. Oh, that's, pretty big but no. this dorm yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, okay. So I always ask this question and it stumps some people, but what would you say to your future self 15 years from now, uh, almost as like a message in a bottle, whether that's congratulatory or just, you know, say whatever the hell you want to say uh, to yourself 15 years from now. Now, then you can look back on it 15 years from now and see what you said. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it, that's one of those questions. that's like only, uh, yeah, it's like, you can't really prepare for that, which I'm glad. Um, I think just look to look back and smile on your life mm. and to, yeah. when things are hard to remember, remember that you got through them and that you're here and that, you know, I just love when I'm chanting, I feel like I love that analogy of like when I'm climbing, climbing a mountain, you know, mm. and then when I'm, when I'm done chanting, I'm able to look out over my life. And I think about how I'm going to feel when, you know, I'm in my 80s and my, my 90s, you know, and I'm in the closing years of my life. Mm -hmm. And I really just wanted to be able to say, I tried my best and um, I did everything to the best of my ability. And I just want to be able to enjoy, you know. And so I think a message to someone 15 years from now, myself, would be t to look back, look back on me, look back on, I think the biggest thing, yeah, I think the biggest thing is looking back on that smaller self, hmm. you know, that person in me that felt so scared when I was a kid sometimes, and, and as a teenager that feels so scared, and remember that no matter how old, no matter how big, no matter how whatever I may look or be or feel, that a part of me is a little kid who is scared and doesn't know what the future holds and to be able to walk around in life with that kid in mind and to be kind to him. Um, I just want someone myself 15 years from now to remember that kid and that um, he's also the, he's also the oomph behind all the things you do. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that little yeah. version of myself, yeah, that you, that I get to let out through my art, you know. Yeah. Well said. Love it. Uh, so my final question really is: Is there a phrase or motto that you live by uh, in order for you to kind of, you know, keep pushing forward, or or something that you just kind of always stick to and is stuck with you uh, throughout your your career thus far? Right. I don't know. I mean, there, there's so many things, so many ones that I happen upon that I just love. Um, 
so it's hard for me to like put one up there, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I think it just right now it would be Namio Horenge Kyo. I mean, when when things get hard, when things get dark for me, I I, I turn to the Gohans and I turn to myself. I turn to Namio Horenge Kyo, and I just I'm able to find myself. I'm able to dialogue with that smaller little kid in me, and I'm able mm. to be in the midst of processing um, without fighting so strong. Because, you know, so much of me just wants to fight and just wants to, you know, just to let that go is mm. everything. Mm. And Namu Horenge Kyo is, um, I can't explain it. It's mystic, you know, literally. It's, I can't, can't explain why it works. It does. It helps me. Um, it helps my life and it helps everything I do. And so that's what I do. People turn to all sorts of things and I'm so fortunate that that's where I turn to and not what I used to turn to. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm so appreciative of that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that kind of wraps it up. I uh, just like to ask kind of, you know, I know we just talked about social media and you having in a yeah. private account, but if people yeah. wanted to follow you and or see the work that you do, uh, where can they kind of, you know, check you out? I don't know if you have like a, a website or a blog, if, if people even have blogs, but, uh, or another uh, page that they can kind of check you out on, uh, right. where would that be? Um. I mean, yeah, you know, for sure. Go check out my Instagram. Do it. Uh, you can request to follow me. I'll, I might decline it. I might accept it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just my name, at Kelton, du Kelton Dumont, K-E-L-T-O-N, Dumont, D-U-M-O-N-T. I'm on Instagram. Don't have any other social media. Um, yeah. Yeah. Check me out. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so yeah. much, Kelton. Yeah. yeah. Yes, slide into his DMs. How about that? We're just gonna yes, send slide, everyone. Slide in my DMs. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> he needs he needs a lot of DMs specifically about yeah, uh, really yeah his his life. I love it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate all your time and uh, sharing so much of your own personal story. And uh, yeah, I really do look forward to not only seeing what happens on the next season of uh, the excuse me, the righteous gemstones, as well as everything else that you're gonna come out with. I'm sure in the coming years. So thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Alan. This has been really wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this week's episode of the Creative Lotus Podcast. And a huge thank you to Kelton for all of his amazing stories. This week's Buddhist quote of the week is, Do not despair or grow impatient over transient phenomena. Life is long. Even if you have problems, even if you have done things you regret or have made mistakes, your whole future still lies ahead of you by Daisaku Ikeda. Thank you once again for watching. Go ahead and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching here on YouTube, hit that big old thumbs up button. It really does help out. Check out this video up in this corner for a full episode of the Creative Lotus Podcast. And until then, I'll see you there. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Bye-bye. What is up, Creative Lotus family? Thank you so much for supporting the Creative Lotus Podcast. Go ahead and follow us on social media. On Facebook, we're at the Creative Lotus Podcast. Here on YouTube, maybe you're watching, we're at the Creative Lotus Podcast as well. And on Instagram, we're at the Creative Lotus Pod. And my personal handle is at Alan Zaki. We say thank you once again. Go ahead and subscribe, listen, write a review. And until the next episode, we'll see you there. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Bye-bye.